Welcome. My name is Mark DePew. I'm the Director of Oral History with the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library. Today is Monday, July 21st, 2014, and today I'm with Gary Price. Good morning, Gary. Good morning. Uh, we're going to be talking to Gary a couple sessions at least. Uh, Gary's had a long career in the United States Marine Corps as an aviator. Today's focus is going to be all about your experiences in Vietnam, but you didn't really spend much time in Vietnam itself. No. Um, Fascinating story, though, because you were there at the end, and that's uh, where we're going to end up. But let's start at the beginning of your story, Gary, and tell me a little bit about when and where you were born. Well, I was born in Fresno, California, and I was raised in California, actually northern California, Sonora, northern part, Stanislaus County. Grew up there. Uh, Dad was a teacher in high school, so we had, you had those challenges where your dad's a teacher and you're a student, and so the kids always made fun of you a lot of times. But other than that... Uh, Grew up with the desire to fly. My dad got me in our line control model airplanes, and that kind of put the bug into me. Sunday after church, we'd go to the airports and watch airplanes take off and land for hours, we'd bring a lunch and something. That's what we did, and that was how we entertained ourselves from Sundays. He had that same desire and put the bug into me. And uh, so over the time, I ended up wanting to fly. And so, what was your birthday again? October 7th, 1948. Was your dad a World War II veteran? No, he was not. He was not a veteran at all. In fact, the only veterans in my family was my uncle, who was a World War II veteran, uh, MP, so he was like my favorite uncle. He always had stories, you know, <laughs> sea stories about what he did and what he didn't do. And, and of course, when I got in the Marine Corps, it became a two-way. We started part, you know, sharing stories about what we'd done and where we're going. But uh, no, I, my dad was not a veteran, and uh, he did not discourage me, did not encourage me, just, you know, pushed me in the direction I want to go. What kind of, uh, what subject was your dad teaching? Actually, he taught mechanical drawing, and he was studying to be a school psychologist on the side, so he ended up getting his master's and becoming the school psychologist and with it before I graduated. So he, that's, I had one class with him. I actually got an A in it. Everybody <laughs> thought I was, you know, had some... Uh, uh, partiality going on, but I did, and I worked hard because <laughs> I had to. My dad was a teacher there, and I couldn't let him down. So anyway, but mechanical drawing, and that was mainly his, his uh, he did a little coaching on the side in tennis uh, when he had a chance. So the class you took was a mechanical drawing class? Yes, sir. Okay. How about your mother? Tell me a little bit about your mother. We always teased my mom that she learned to talk and talk a lot when she was a telephone operator. Back in the days when you actually pull the plug out and plug them in, that's when she became an operator, a telephone operator. She did that because my dad went back to college to get his teaching credentials, or at least his graduate degree. And uh, so mom actually put us, you know, she brought home the money, but she did it talking on the telephone, being a telephone operator. So she talked, and we always teased her even today that she learned her gift of gab anytime, anywhere, for how long as she want to talk by starting off with a telephone operator. But she did that for 20 years. She, well, 20 years in a telephone AT&T company. And we finally moved to Northern California, and then she worked for AT&T as a front office lady, and she collected the bills and so forth, but she retired. So which one of your parents do you take after, Gary? I don't know. I probably... A little bit of both. You know, right now my dad passed away about seven, eight years ago, and, uh, and he left the family for a while, so we got closer to my mom's side. Um, and so probably my mom in that regard. But uh, she's been my, spirit, uh, my spiritual mentor in life as well as my, uh, I call her every day when I go home from work just to say hi and what's going on. Do you lack for words yourself? Probably not. <laughs> Good. So I'm, I, uh, I can talk. Where did you move to in, in Northern California? A town called Sonora. It's an old uh, Sonora, Columbia, Twain Heart, or a kind of old gold rush uh, towns. In fact, the Sonora Creek that ran through the town, I used to spend time when I had a little bit off from high school going down and panning for gold. And you always found gold. I mean, it, wasn't, it was everywhere. It wasn't a whole lot. Um, but you pan for gold, and you can get color, as they call it, and you can, if you did it long enough, you can get an ounce out, out of it. But back then, in the 60s, $35 an ounce is what uh, the gold was going for, which was, is not a whole lot, but then it was. And, uh, well, we found some dirt 
at one place, and I worked at the airport loading and mixing fire retardant for these what we call borate planes, TBMs and PBYs, and we spent hours doing nothing, waiting for the fire. So we would we would sneak off at night and get this dirt, and come back and we pan this dirt <laughs> over a faucet. We got all kinds of gold. We really did. We couldn't. We went to the jewelry stores in the local areas and sold it to them. Nuggets, you know, the size of your little finger. We got a lot of gold. So there's. So the gold rush, is, the gold is still there. It's just a matter of knowing where to get it and how to get it. This is stuff you're doing in high school? Yeah, high school. What was it like thinking back? You know, we're roughly in the same generation. A lot of people get very nostalgic about growing up during those years. Those good years to be growing up in Sonora? I thought so. I mean, uh, it was you, we, it wasn't uncommon to see someone walking down the street, cowboy boots, cats, wearing a six gun on the side of the hip, you know, that's kind of the, the, the culture we had. Uh, it was a disruption of our, 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 what we thought was right when the long hair hippie movement came in, Haight-Ashbury in the late 60s, 60 time frame. And so we always harassed uh, those, those kids that came up just because we could, you know, because we didn't like what they were, what they stood for. And uh, but that time frame, well, of course, up there it was, it was the 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 country, the the outdoors. A rodeo was the biggest thing in town, and uh, riding horses. My sister had six, seven horses, and so that was the uh, the time frame we we spent. Um, I did a lot of hunting, I did a lot of fishing, and a lot of people did the same thing my in my generation. So at least in that area. So I thought it was a good life. It was a wholesome life, and, uh, and, and my dad was a school teacher, and mom worked in the town, so we were involved community-wise, too. Did you live on a farm? We lived on 10 acres of land. It wasn't a farm. Dad tried to make it a farm, an apple farm, but the deers kept eating all the <laughs> apples, and so we didn't raise anything to eat, basically, that much. And, uh, but we had all kinds of apple trees, and they were uh, around the house and so forth. But, but no, no, we lived, ne we lived out in the country next to a horse ranch. And um, when we, you know, I shot my deer in the backyard. I'd do a quail hunt in the backyard. And so it was one of those places where it was still isolated and uh, you could do a lot of things. Uh, uh, we li real close to our house uh, was this big granite boulder. And, uh, and it was covered with dirt, but when it rained real hard, it would open up some holes. And if you clean the holes out, you find out that this was a land, a spot where the Indians were grinding their acorns and they were making, you know, you can almost lay out the whole area, a hole here, a small hole there, where we figured they were Indians would come up from the creek because behind our house there was a uh, uh, burial ground. And every year tulips would come up where the graves were at. Now they'd been robbed, but the tulips kept coming up every year, there were about five or six of them up there. So the Miwok Indians wasn't too far from where we're at, so we figured the Miwok Indians, you know, kind of moved around, used this big old granite boulder to mush up, the, you know, the acorns and make whatever they wanted to make there. The creek was close by, so they probably had water for that. So it was kind of a nice area. We would walk around, find Indian arrowheads sometimes in our land, and so but that's kind of what we did. Kids, my, grand, my kids came up there, and we would build tree houses, and so... It was kind of a you know, back to nature trip when I came home. Well, it sounds like a great place for a kid with an imagination. <laughs> that, well, you had to have imagination because there wasn't much else to do. You can get out there and you know, you get back and you're isolated somewhat. Uh, we had a half mile dirt road to get to the main road from where we lived. And so we came home, you know, when we got the cars and got older, uh, probably as very little as possible because once we got home, we kind of stayed there. What year did you graduate from high school? In 1966. And you went to public school, apparently? I did. Any other extracurricular activities? Um, th that time, no. Just in, in school, just sports. I played football, and wrestle, and tennis. And What did you think you wanted to do when you graduated? I wanted to be a physical education coach. And I went to junior college, Modesto, which was a couple hours away and a major in physical education. That was my desire. And, uh, and I, was, I thought I was pretty good at math, so I was gonna go with a math minor because that was a little bit different from the normal PE type majors being history or English. 
And uh, at that time, it, they didn't appeal to me as much. And I thought I had a chance maybe have that niche with the math. Um, math, I did okay. Um, I just didn't, I graduated from junior college, but I just didn't, lost the motivation to kind of really jump into the two-year, four-year mm -hmm. element. Of course, Vietnam was coming up or had been around, and I went to school to go to school because most of my friends jumped in the National Guard to not get drafted, and I didn't think much about it. Uh, we went down and watched Green Beret when it first came out, about nine or ten of us, and Everybody but Jim Podesta and I, they all joined up in the Army. And uh, the next day, they signed up. It was a that's how motivated you were sometimes in watching these movies. And, uh, but no, they, uh, they, jo they joined up to go in the Army. A lot of my friends went to the National Guard. I just went to college, you know. Before we get beyond the high school and the college years, do you remember um, the Cuban Missile Crisis at all? Did you pay attention to that? No. I think you probably remember this one, though. JFK assassination, 1963, yeah. November 63. Yeah. What do you remember about that event? To be honest, not a whole lot that happened. It was a tragedy. Uh, I know the school shut down in that regard. Uh, we didn't, you know, at the time, we just, people had speculations, you know, they had theories about what happened, what was going to happen. And of course, with the next, what, two, three weeks, we had the other Kennedy shot as well. So it became um, a, a pretty tragic event. Whole well, we had the uh, assassin who was, uh, who was killed yeah. right afterwards. Yeah. Right. You mentioned already that you always had this interest in flying. So yeah. I'm surprised that you weren't interested in joining the military right out of high school. Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I think one because I didn't have a college degree at the time and I didn't want to fly helicopters. That wasn't my desire at the time. I want to fly jets um, just because that was seemed to be the thing and uh, and that required a college degree and I didn't have one. And uh, so my mom knew I want to fly and they were in San Francisco on a conference, a governmental type of conference and my dad was I guess in the doing what he had to do. My mom was walking around looking in the hallways and they had all these uh, employment uh, opportunities and they had all four services there. When was this? Do you remember the year? Um, it had to be in the 71 time frame. 71, maybe late 70, November time frame because I actually signed up in May of 71 so it wasn't too far before that uh, because she was down there and the story goes, as she tells him, that uh, she went down to the different recruiters saying, my son want to fly jets, uh, but he hadn't got a college degree. And so the Air Force says, well, you need to call a degree. We can't help you. And so she goes to the Navy, can't help you. The Army says, well, I can fly helicopters, but he didn't want to fly helicopters, she said. So she gets to the Marine Corps, and a custody old gunnery sergeant says, we've got the program for your son. Just sign right here, and we'll sign him up. And so... I get a phone call Monday, it was over the weekend, Monday, say I'm scheduled for a physical for Oakland uh, Naval Air Station on a certain date. And um, I was a little taken back, so I said, well, I don't think, I'm, who, who, who signed me up? <laughs> a lady named Dorothy Price. Oh, geez, that's my mom. <laughs> so I said, let me call you back. So I called my mom. She said, well, Gary, you want to fly. Here's an opportunity to fly jets and be an officer in whole works. And I said, okay, maybe this was my destiny. I don't know. So I ended up calling back, scheduled the physical. I passed the physical. I took the written test for aviation. I passed all that. So the next thing it was no, I raised my hand in May of 71. And in August of 71, I was, my dad never been to the airports and never flown an airline. So he takes me to San Francisco to fly me to, to uh, OCS, Officer Cannon School in Quantico. And of course, we were all a little bit nervous. I never flown before. And I get on the airlines and I'm flying and of course the, the, the stewardess talk about your travels and a few things and next thing I remember hearing she says, well, we'll be landing in LaGuardia in New York. And I'm thinking, no, no, I'm not supposed to go there. I'm supposed to go to Washington, D.C. And found out that I was on the wrong airlines. And of course you think, how can that happen? Well, it happened. We're on the wrong airlines. So now I got to New York. I had to go another, another place to get another flight back to Washington, D.C. So that started my... <laughs> 
my military career already in a wrong flight, getting very late. It was one of the last buses, in fact, the last bus to leave Washington, D.C. area airport to uh, go to Quantico. And uh, that's kind of how it started. But. I'm, I'm interested in your timeline because you graduated from high school in 66. Did you complete an associate's degree in 68? No, no. I, I quit school. And uh, I went back after about one semester and got the last classes I needed to graduate. So I actually probably graduated in 69. Okay. But that's about the time that the draft is going hot and heavy. And you obviously are in good shape physically. There's nothing that would prevent you from being drafted. That's right. So how was it that you were able to avoid the military until 71? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I had my draft card was 1A. I, I mean, I didn't avoid it. I was just waiting to be called. And, uh, and I didn't get called. And, uh, and so, and, you know, I ended up joining the Marine Corps and obviously <laughs> that eliminated okay. being drafted. I know, I think it was December of 69 that they changed the draft system and went to the lottery and that started in 1970. Do you so remember what your number was? I do not. Fairly high? High enough that they weren't interested in you? It may be in the 1200 category. Okay. If that makes any sense. I don't okay. Know. okay. I don't know. Actually, I didn't really care. I mean, I, if my call, my number was called, I was, I was going to go. I, uh, it was just one of those things where, you know, I got myself out of high school, I mean, out of college. You know, with, now I'm 1A. Now the lottery is coming around. And I really didn't, you know, I said, okay, I wasn't going to voluntarily join for that reason, but I wasn't going to, you know, run to Canada either if I got called in to go. Fortunately, things worked out to where I just signed up the Marine Corps before all that happened. Okay, let's talk about your experiences at Quantico. Okay. Because my understanding is it's not, they're not necessarily gentle to young officer candidates there. No, they're not. They, uh, it's 12 it's weeks of course, uh, officer candidate school, and it's just like boot camp at Paris Island, you know, San Diego. Uh, probably not as... It's not as long, obviously, but uh, but no, we you had to be physically fit, and that was one of the uh, main points that I remember because I could do 20 pull-ups and I could do 100 sit-ups in in uh, two minutes. I, and max run was 18, and I was in that 21, 20 and a half category, so I was probably in the top third, if not top fourth, of my class. And the class was about 200 plus the company, about 200 Marines. And so I was singled out a lot of times to make up a pull-up bar uh, chart. We had a pull-up bar and a squad by open squad bay, and I had to make sure everybody signed off doing their pull-ups at night because I could do pull-ups and nobody else could. Three was minimum to pass, and most were in that five and six category. And so, but that's where I remember. We did a lot of hikes, a lot of physical fitness, uh, three-mile runs and hikes with packs and so forth. And, we end up doing a lot of little war gamings, hiking 20 miles and then bivouac, dig holes and play the war games a little bit and hike back. I know uh, at present, if you don't have a college degree, you're not going to get a commission of any type. Obviously, the rules were different at that time. Well, evidently, when my mom saw this recruiter in San Francisco, he was mentioning a program that the Marine Corps just opened up for a short time. Post-Vietnam, they were... I guess the riff uh, of aviators as well as officers in general was occurring, and well, that was a reason I don't know, but they had a six. They had a window where you had to be a graduate of two-year college uh, and transferable transferable to a four-year college and accepted as a junior, which I had that. That's as far as I got, and. Uh, but and that and and based on that, they would send me to Officer Canada School, and if I qualify for aviation, send me right to Pensacola, and that's the program I was in. And as I got to Quantico, I found out in my 200 plus company, there were six of us in that program. Six of you who didn't have college degrees. Yeah. Well, not necessarily a group that you want to belong to, was it? Well, at the time, we didn't care, you know. <laughs> we were fellow Marines, you know. We were all, we were candidates at that time. <laughs> Crawling around in the mud, it doesn't make a whole lot of <laughs> it difference. It doesn't make a difference. <laughs> the only bad thing or good thing is that because most of us, uh, it was about half of us were for an aviation. Jim, Sakura, Mike, about five of us were for aviation. 
and we went straight to Pensacola and started training. Now every other Marine all has to go to training basic school, which is a six month school. And there's where you learn to be what they call a rifleman. Every Marine's a rifleman and that's where you actually do a lot of shooting, a lot more live action, a lot more live ordnance and uh, to become that rifle Marine. Rifleman. When did you graduate from Quantico? Um, November 72, 71. Okay, November 71. So the war in Vietnam is still going on. We're definitely on the downhill slope. By 1973, all ground forces are basically out of the picture. So you're looking at a path for training now that's basically going to, um, not going to get you to Vietnam. You're not going to see any action in Vietnam because essentially the war's over in 73. And they were, you know, war planners were thinking that was the case by that time. And yeah. it sounds like from what you said, the Marines were already thinking about the problems they're going to have with an excess of lieutenants and captains when the war ends and then needing new lieutenants to come into the system. Does, is that about right? Well, I know that they were short of aviators for whatever reason. I knew they took the guns off the Hueys after post-Vietnam. And we spent another 10 years putting guns back on the Hueys because we were short gun ships in the Marine Corps. Um, I, don't, I know that there was a, a lot of uh, lieutenants uh, in these squadrons I was in and saw. Um, we're all new guys. There was a few captains around, some majors who were Vietnam veterans and such. Um, from my little world, you know, I was, uh, I was just fortunate to get in the window to be an officer and a pilot under, without a college degree. And uh, the rest of the guys were in the same boat. Some of them went back and got the degree, which I did as well, but a lot of them did not. And uh, You said you graduated from uh, OCS in November of 71. Did you also get commissioned then? Yes. Okay. But your status is a, an aviation cadet or something like that? Nope. Uh, unlike the other services, we, when you graduate from officer cannon school, you are commissioned a second lieutenant, period. Everybody goes to training basic school for six months. I went to Pensacola, Florida for training, pilot training. And I say pilot training because at that time it could be anything. It could be helo, fixed wing, uh, or, or proper jets. It didn't really matter, but you're going to go for pilot training. And six of us went down at that time frame. And uh, we just started. We, at that time, we are just second lieutenants going through pilot training. There was not a name to us. We weren't aviation cadets or anything. We were a Marines lieutenant in the Pensacola training program. Okay. Uh, a couple more house cleaning questions for okay. you here, Gary. Did you have a girlfriend at the time? Uh, no. Actually, when I graduated from Quantico, went to Pensacola, um, it wasn't until halfway through my training. Training was last about a year. I met, I think I met my wife, future wife, and it had to be December, January time frame. Jim Cartwright, a good friend of mine, and he's the last of my class Marine who stayed in. He became a four-star general. Uh, anyway, his, his first wife, they moved down and lived on the beach. Jim was in, the, he was a real backseat pilot. He didn't have the eyes at the time uh, to become pilot. So he was in a different program, but in the same area. So anyway, he calls me up. I'm at Whiting Field, Naval Air Station Whiting Field. And he says, Gary, I got a small party at the house here. Why don't you come on over? So anyway, his sister, Cindy, came down and her girlfriend, Susie, my future, they traveled around a lot together and they were down there visiting. And as it worked out, Susie was the only one that wasn't matched up with somebody. So I'm not sure it was a set up blind date or just come <laughs> and enjoy yourself, whatever. But anyway, I met Susie at that time and Six months later and six visits later, we were married. Married in November. Well, I would imagine that the Marine Corps had you fairly busy with uh, aviation training in well, the meantime. Well, they did, and this wedding kind of interfered with that. In fact, <laughs> I ended up getting, uh, I didn't pass a check ride. And uh, at that time, you got three downs, as they call it, in the whole training program, from once you start to once you finish, three downs. If you get three downs, you were washed out of the program. And so I had my first down in the last stages of my training. And, uh, and of course, 
when they ask me, you know, anything interfering with their thoughts and training and, and uh, attention, I said, well, I'm getting married tomorrow. Well, that's good enough. <laughs> We'll come back, give you a couple of ETs, and continue on. That's exactly what happened. Went up Rockford, Illinois. We got married, drove back. The next day, we got there. I put her in this apartment complex. It was cheap. I wasn't going to be there very long, I thought. Unfortunately for Susie, when I left her at nights, I had night flights to do. The professional wrestlers in the town, they were there on weekends, Gorgeous George and all those guys, they all stayed the same place. So when I came back at midnight or one o'clock, the cops and the lights were trolling around. There was ambulances here, you know, because they all had fights around the area. Susie's in her room, says, Gary, Gary, what are you doing to me? You know, I end up, so I end up giving her my gun in case she got scared even more. But anyway, we were there for almost three weeks, longer than we were planned. So I got my wings in December, and, and there's a picture of her, we're pinning my wings on the ceremony, and then after that, we drove to California. Was that December of 72 now? Yes. Okay, so roughly a, a year there in flight yeah. school. Yes. At that, during that time period then, was this strictly, were you progressing from basic trainers, fixed wings, to jets, to helicopters? How did that process go? You start off with the, the ground school. I remember taking tests for aerodynamics and uh, a few other stuff, you know, survival training and doing all your uh, physical um, uh, requirements as far as uh, swimming goes and, and all, all that was happening for about three, three weeks. Then we all went to um, Naval Air Station Softly where we did T-34 training and I already flown by this time now I already had my private license. I got my license, civilian license, so I had some flight time. In fact I even had a flight in the T-34. So when I got in the aircraft Things were, weren't all that unfamiliar. A T-34 was a fixed wing? Low wing, fixed wing prop job. T-34B, uh, Mentor was the name. It's a, a low wing aircraft. It's got uh, tandem seats, you know, front and back, stick, throttle on the side, and uh, nothing real fancy, basic training aircraft. In fact, they're still flying for basic training some places. But anyway, I sold in that, I think in like, 10 hours or less, and it was they accelerated. They told me they accelerated me through the program because I didn't really need all the extra flights, which was good and bad, as I found out later on. But T 34 was the first step, and Naval Air Station softly. Next station for all of us was Naval Air Station Whiting Field, where you did fixed wing training. We flew a T 28 at that time, T 28, T 28 Charlie. Uh, which was the Navy version because the Air Force flew the T-28 as well. It has a great big engine like the P-51 and the Corsair, that big engine. And it's, again, Tam seating, a great big aircraft, it looks to me. But it's one of those aircraft when you sit in the front there and you're cranking it up and the blades are turning and the smoke is popping out. You kind of look back at the John Wayne movies and the carriers and all that kind of crap. That's how you had, that's, a, that's the feeling you had, you know, back in that era with that kind of aircraft. So I flew that for, I got a couple hundred hours in that aircraft, about a hundred hours plus, and you did formation, cross country training, instrument flying. So at that stage is where I went to helicopters, other people went to prop or fixed wing training. It could be jets or it could be propeller driven. We had the C-130 cargo plane. We also had the OV-10, a twin engine observation plane. And then of course you had jets. And so, you left at that point based on your score and what the needs of the Marine Corps were. A long time before in this interview, you mentioned what you wanted to do was to fly jets. jets. What happened? Well, now I'm in the Marine Corps and I wasn't sure if I was going to stay a career in the Marine Corps. I figured I had an obligation of six and a half years. And uh, so I thought, well, if I get out in six and a half years, I would have a lot better chance of getting a flying job if I had it both helicopter training, helicopter rating and fixed wing rating. I can play both cards and hopefully be a more remarkable uh, pilot on the outside. And at that time, there was articles about the helicopter side coming more popular in the civilian side. So I won helicopters. And uh, as it worked out, I ended up taking my tests later on and I got both my ratings, helicopter and fixed wing. Well, this is still, there's still American troops involved in Vietnam. And 
my understanding is that the uh, the casualty rate for helicopters and helicopter pilots was significantly higher than for fixed wing aircraft. Would that be right? Probably so. <laughs> was did that even factor into your consideration? No, it did not. And uh, to be honest with you, I didn't even think about the. Uh, I, I thought about the mission of the helicopter I was going to fly. I want to fly. And, and I, how do you figure out that one? Well, you talk to other pilots who flew that aircraft or flew different aircraft. And of course, they all have their passions and reasons why they fly their aircraft. And of course, their aircraft is always the best aircraft. And so, unfortunately for me, there was more CH-46 pilots in the, in that I could talk to. And uh, the, the CH-46 mission was to carry troops primarily, cargo secondarily, and medevac. And so they, uh, the story goes, was that, well, you're at the, you're at the forefront because the, the grunts are the ones who are the fighting force. You'd be moving the grunts around and supporting the grunts. And, and everybody else supports the grunts, but you are actually carrying, you actually planning missions with them because you have to get them on the ground. And that appealed to me. And so I went to CH-46 training. Uh, that's my desire in the West Coast of my coast of choice. I think we've got a picture here that we can show of the CH-46. And did you start training on the CH-46 then only after you got to basically a duty station? Yes, once you got your wings. Okay, there's the helicopter. There CH-46. Once you got your wings, then of course you, you put your dream sheet in. I wanted to fly this, plat this type of helicopter and I want to go to this east coast, west coast. And so I had picked CH-46s and coming from the west coast, I picked the west coast. And I went to, I was assigned to Marine Corps Air Station, Santa Ana in California. And uh, I was assigned initially to HMT, a training helicopter squadron. They had both Heloc 46s and a CH-53. And they, they gave both trainings. I was there for about two or three months and acquired my, what they call, helicopter second pilot, H2P. And they, they do all the training. And okay, now we've gotten into the military jargon here big time. HMT, yes. what would that stand for? Helicopter, uh, Marine Helicopter Training, HMT, 301. And the East Coast has 302. And then they have 303. And there are just different platform helicopters they train. The Cobras, TAC helicopters, or the Hueys, another utility aircraft, were in different training mm -hmm. groups. And of course, when people think of Vietnam and they think of helicopters, everyone thinks of the Huey. The aircraft, though, that we looked at at the picture a little bit earlier looks very similar to what the Army's CH-47 would be. In fact, it's made by the same company, Boeing Vertol. Uh, the the CH-47, the Chinook, um, you can, they look at us, the Army guys, as a baby Chinook, and we look at them as a big 46, you know. So. But we have some of the same parts, and we have shared some parts that has Boeing labels on them, pitch link bearings, whatever. We, we exchange here and there when we get a chance. But uh, it is a smaller version of the 47. There are differences, and, but... Uh, well, tell me about the, uh, the characteristics of flying one of those, and the crew, if you would. Well, it hasn't got a tail rotor, and uh, the Huey's got a tail rotor. In fact, almost all the helicopters have tail rotors, which has an inherent aerodynamic characteristics that you have to be careful of. Well, the 46 does not. It has two, just two tandem rotors, counterclockwise, meshed together, synchronized, and uh, it has three wheels. The wheel in the front's not steerable uh, with the rudder or anything, or pedals. It is canistered where you have to move the aircraft up and down and then move the stick right or left to get it to go in that direction. So the true art of flying, or the hardest part was taxing this aircraft. Now we call the aircraft the frog, because from the back end it looks like a frog with the, the bulging fuel tanks on the side and a nose in front. It looks like a frog. And so we always call ourselves a frog pilot, P-H-R-O-G, frog. I thought uh, they called it a sea knight. Well that's the official name. Okay. But we all call it the frog, frog flyers and uh, the, the battle frog and you know the killer frogs. But CH-46, sea knight is the official name, yeah. But is it a challenge to fly one of those? Uh, it was. It, it's a more challenge to, to take in the size of this aircraft. Uh, because when you land the aircraft, where you're looking at, just like you think of uh, an airliner, you know, he's way up front, but the wheels are all in the back. When you land down, when you land the aircraft, whether it's on a runway or whether it's a pinnacle, 
you got to be thinking you're about 30 feet behind you where those wheels would be sitting down. And you could sit down there and hold the nose off the ground, and that could be over a cliff, just let the grunts out, whatever it may be. But you're thinking of that. So the size of the aircraft is what the biggest adjustment was. You know, it was pretty stable, a stable aircraft. Uh, and all our aircraft in the military at that time were, it had autopilot, it had stability systems, so it was pretty stable aircraft to fly, both in uh, instruments and conditions. But it was a fun aircraft to fly. I mean, it was maneuverable. We would do air combat maneuvering with the aircraft, so we can move around pretty good with it. Um, but the challenge was more to, from the Huey to go to the 46, is just to take it in the size of the aircraft was more the challenge. And then taxiing, because you knew if you were a rookie, because if you hit too hard, you bottom out, and if you pull back too much, the nose come off the ground. So you had to find that magic moment in there, and every aircraft's different. It had its own little personality about how that oleo strut moved up and down. What was the crew size? We had a pilot, co-pilot, and non-combat, we would have probably one crew chief and uh, one guy in the back who's probably a corporal, he's a mechanic. Um, during combat, we would have, uh, we got, our aircraft will hold two 50 cal guns on the side, so we would have two gunners on the side who would carry a couple thousand rounds of ammo. And then we have a crew chief, and he may even, depends on the mission, have a mechanic with them, so it'd be two, four, maybe six people total in that aircraft flying. Did you have a specified ground crew as well, or did the ground crews work on all the aircraft? The, uh, in mission profile, there were no ground crews. At the squadron, we had ground crews that would work on all the aircraft. But, uh, and they would see if we had aircraft problems, they would initially be coming out to help us to troubleshoot the problem and get it fixed and go. But once you took off, there's just no ground crew to support you unless you call them from the squadron to help you. What so, kind of missions? You talked about the uh, troop transport. Anything else that the aircraft would be expected to do? We uh, we did look. We did logistics, uh, supply, uh, transport to support the grunts. Uh, medevac was another one that we did, and uh, actually, in early on there in in California, we had two side missions. I didn't tell you about that earlier. We had two side missions. When the presidents came, was it Nixon and Reagan, when they came, they would have uh, their West Coast place to hang out. HMX came, we were their backup to the HMX. So we actually had a VIP kit. This was when I first got to Pensac uh, got to the West Coast. We would, weekend duty, we were assigned and we would take out the, we would take out the, the web seats which usually had oil stains on them. And we would put in uh, actually airline seats in them bolt them in, they were red and vinyl covering, block off the back so you can't see it, and the whole works, a vinyl layout in the front. That was a VIP kit, and that was our, we would set the aircraft up, and sometimes we would fly to El Toro to stand by for the next six, seven hours, while the, you know, we were back up to the backup. But it was a mission. And, uh, and the other one was is that we got some training picking up, uh, in fact, you see it now in the news, um, uh, water bottles, uh, water uh, bags, and help to drop, put out fires. And we did some of that on the side. So that was a couple of things we did. Um, you know, not really a side mission, but some side, a side, a term side task that we end up learning to do while we were there on the West Coast. Did you guys like that VIP mission? No. No, like VIP mission. <laughs> no. Why not? Just, just the nature of the beast. I remember a flight, and was, I was a co pilot. This was in HMT 301. We had to move a general, two-star general, from some place down at Camp Pendleton. We took off, we went to the clouds, got on top of the clouds, flew down to Camp Pendleton, and um, I'm trying to think of the pilot, I'll never forget it. We end up, and I'm just a fly along, and we're co-pilot, we're flying down, and we see two peaks in Camp Pendleton above the clouds of Fog Bank. So we fly to this peak over here, we hover over the top of the peak, we see a road, we air taxi down this freaking road just above treetops for about three or four miles. We get to the bottom. We, it opens up where I can see about maybe a mile, mile and a half. We go over to the coordinates where the general was. We pick him up and we move him two clicks, 2,000 yards, and let him down. And his, the car that dropped him off picks him up and takes him somewhere else. That's VIP missions. And that's just the nature of the word. They were just that way. You had to be there, and they were important missions. 
but from you know from a standpoint of what we did a lot of times it just didn't make a whole lot of sense did you enjoy the fire suppression missions a little bit more yes a little better just a little better a little better yeah okay how long were there in california then I was in the HMT, the training squadron, for about six months. Got there in January. I think I transferred out June or July, uh, June, July time frame. We were in the blimp hangars. They're still there, in fact. Um, and Goodyear uh, still uses them when they come in there. But the blimp hangar had, I don't know, four squadrons in there, four or five squadrons. And so I was on one side of the blimp hangar, and I walked across the other side of the hangar and checked in to HMT, HMM, helicopter... Marine medium is what that stands for. 163 evil eyes. And evil eyes, for some reason, they had painted a couple of eyes on the front of the aircraft. And their Vietnam story was that when they, the Vietnamese, I guess, or the Viet Cong saw these aircraft with those eyes and they came carrying troops and they were shooting guns from their side to get them in the zones, they were, I guess, evil. And so evil eyes is how that name came about from the stories I've been told. But th that unit being in California illustrates that uh, the military was basically out of Vietnam by the time you got to that unit. Well, the units in California would either go to a, on a cruise, a ship cruise for six months, or they would go to Okinawa for, six, for a year at a time frame. So the squadrons back in the States wouldn't normally be the ones taken out of Vietnam the ones that maybe in Hawaii aboard ships probably came off. And um, I know we, were, we had airplanes stationed there, but yeah, you're right, probably most of them all out of country. And we support it from the ship side or our standby side, basically like in Okinawa. Were you hearing lots of war stories from other members of the unit, some of the more senior members? No, no, and, and that was the, the ironic thing I found is that the only time you hear them talk about their experiences in Vietnam was at a bar, and they had to be half tanked talking about it. They just didn't talk about it. And just like now, you hear some stories about World War II veterans or even Korean veterans. They just don't talk about their experiences. Either it was so tragic and, and they just didn't want to bring up those memories. But a lot of my friends, uh, they were friends at the unit who came back. They were captains and sometimes majors. Then they didn't want to bring, didn't talk about it. Now the training we did was post there what they learned. We would fly initially when I got there, flying high, 1,500 feet, and we would get over to a LZ, a landing zone, and we would stay out of small arm fire, and we were trained to stay over that small area and do 360s, land and pop in the zone, and then that's what we did. So it was a lot of times it was just uh, hand-eye coordination, more training, you know, to learn the aircraft, get the feel a better was also a practical use for it too. And so then we went to when the surface air missiles came around, the training went from the high 360s down to low altitude. So now we're below the trees and we would kind of fly along the river beds and so forth and kind of pop up and then drop in. Map of the earth. You map guys like earth. flying map of the earth, don't you? Yeah, we do. Uh, that's fun. <laughs> map of the earth flying is, is, is a challenge. You gotta learn how to read a map and read the contours, but it's more fun to fly. Okay. How long were you in California before you got to your next post? Actually, I was uh, probably about a year. Um, at the time, the Marine Corps had the individual replacement going on to Okinawa. And so there was 13-month tours going on uh, in Okinawa, different pilots from different areas. It was based on seniority. You've been there longer than your time came up. Now, when your time came up, it was a quota system that came to the air group. The air group may get 10 pilot requirements for 46 pilots in Okinawa. And so they may put two here and two there and two there, and that's how and the guys who were there the longest got tapped to go. And so it was when HMM-163, that's what the plan was. And Dean Koontz was one of the guys who was assigned to go. And, um, and then before he left, they changed the mandatory requirement to a voluntarily requirement. He had a volunteer to go there. And so he said, I'm not gonna volunteer. And so I left the open billet. And so I don't remember why I volunteered, but I volunteered to take his place. It's 13 months Thir in Okinawa. Yes. Wouldn't that be an unaccompanied tour? That's right, and I just got married. So what did Susie say about that? 
Well, she we. She, she knew what she was getting into yeah. when she married. Well, I don't it. think she did. <laughs> and I don't think she knew it even until halfway through our my whole career. She said, "I don't know what I got into," you know. But anyway, she uh, we were married. She had a small. She worked at a job in a bank, and uh, and so we were looking for a house to buy. And we, and we the houses there were not inexpen were fairly inexpensive back in the seventies. But anyway, she. Uh, we decided when I had the, the orders to go for 13 months, she says, oh, why should I stay here? I'll go home for a year. I'll live at home, work for my dad and all that. And that's what she did. So when I left, when we, she came over to Okinawa one time. And um, we, of course, honeymoons or honeymoons when you have them after you get married. Not a year later, they don't count as honeymoons anymore. And so even though we took a trip to Hong Kong and Taiwan for 10 days, and that was quote our honeymoon. I think today she says, "No, that wasn't. That wasn't. A we didn't have a honeymoon. I don't care what you call it, Gary." <laughs> but anyway, but she didn't like it, obviously, and she went home. But that was 13 months is a long time. But then I got to go to Pensacola, Florida, as a flight instructor. So I was there for four years, and so kind of after the 13 month. Yes, sir. Okay, but it's. The reason we're sitting here today yeah, is because of what happened when you yeah. actually got sent to Okinawa. When did you arrive in Okinawa? Uh, it should be June of 74. Okay. Uh, and yeah. what was your unit of assignment there? I was assigned to HMM 165, called the White Knights. Were you doing the same kind of missions you were doing in California? Yes, doing the same thing, same mission. We did a lot of what we call NTA, Northern Training Area uh, training. Okinawa is only some places in the northern part you trained at. There was some headquarter elements uh, in and around. I was stationed Marine Corps Air Station in Fatima. Not too far from us was Naval uh, Air Force, uh, Kadena Air Force Base. But you had to go further north of the island to find Marine Corps ground units. Camp Hansen was up in that area. Camp Swab was in that area all up there. And they were small camps. The northern area was training, and the grunts, the infantry unit was to go up there as a company or a platoon, and they'd stay there for maybe a week, week and a half, 10 days, and they would be training in this jungle environment. Again, coming post-Vietnam, we, you know, uh, this three-tier canopy jungle was just um, is bad stuff to, to fight in, let alone train in, and this is what they were doing. So we would go up there and stand by overnight when they were in the field, as a medevac because the biggest fear was what they call the habu snake and there was at that time no anti-venom at the, on the island unless there was some small places that had it and it wasn't in very big supply so we were there to carry the marine if he got bit uh, down there as fast as we could because it was uh, it killed a lot a lot of okinawans early on and when i left after a year they were just getting more and more anti-venom but the Habu Snake, northern training area is where we trained at. We would be small little LZs we would practice landing in, um, but that's what we did. We'd land in these places, jungle penetrator cables through the jungle to pick up Marines on the ground, a three-tier jungle penetrator device that's on our uh, hoist. And it's got a three-seat metal heavy thing that would punch through the three-tier, get down the bottom, they pull the three-prong thing out, and they strapped the stuff around it and we pull them up. And that's how we extracted Marines in that kind of environment. Were you a first lieutenant by this time? No, I, not yet. Uh, I was a first lieutenant probably about halfway through my tour there. And so I was a first lieutenant um, before the evacuation started. Okay. I was still a helicopter second pilot, a co-pilot. And so I ended up, um, you had to have 500 hours total time as a minimum. Uh, to be a co-pilot? To be an aircraft commander. And so that was the next step you progressed to. Co-pilot to an aircraft commander. And the difference is that he signs for the aircraft and he's responsible for the aircraft. I'm just his co-pilot. Between the two of you, though, are you getting as much stick time? It depends on who you're flying with. And he says, you know, I'm going to fly the aircraft. And uh, you sit there and you monitor the instruments and you get the pubs out and you go through the checklist, but you may not fly. So well, that doesn't who, sound very exciting. Well, it became who you flew with. And then most of the pi aircraft commanders knew that we were in training to get our check rides, be aircraft commander. So they would let us fly. And we would do certain things to try to 
work on some, you know, he'll ask, what do you want to do? I say, ah, I'd like to do some more combinary, combinary landings or high altitude landings sometimes. We, in California, we had some mountains of work. There weren't too many high altitude areas, but combined areas, we had a lot of them. Combined is just a small tight LZ to land it into. And you could do spirals with that small, or you can do a low altitude jump up in the small, but they're all small. And it took a little coordination, verbal co coordination between your crew in the back to get you cleared in, settled down, how's the ground, how are you looking? One feet, two feet, you're cleared, touchdown. Did you have any additional duties, things that kept you busy when you weren't flying? Well, in the Marine Corps, unlike the Army and Air Force, we have collateral jobs. In fact, you can get more trouble from your collateral job than you can from screwing up being a pilot. My collateral job was in maintenance, so I worked full-time in maintenance, and I would take a break from my full-time job to go fly. And so when I finished flying, do the debriefing, whatever paperwork, and I go back to my job, and I got a regular full-time job. I got, I had a line officer, as they called it. I had about 40 to 50 mechanics and crew chiefs to work with. So I had people under me I had responsible for, accountability for the aircraft that we were working on. So it was a typical full-time job, and I would take a break from that to go fly. How much maintenance time would it take for one hour of flight time, typically? I think the uh, they advertise it almost six hours to one hour, four to six hours to one hour of flight time. It's an old aircraft, and it's even more now because it's still flying. It's a uh, six. Of course, I got bumper stickers saying "Don't trust any aircraft under 40 years," and so. <laughs> By this time, did you think you were flying the best aircraft in the system? Oh, I did. Yeah, there was. You know, you you have some guys who didn't want the 46, but but got it because the needs of the Marine Corps at the time. And that's the criteria, the needs of the Marine Corps got you east coast, west coast, got you into a helo platform or a fixed wing platform, whatever it may have been. And so the needs of the Marine Corps, but I, I felt I lucked out. I flew the 46, that was my choice. And uh, today it's still the best aircraft flying. <laughs> it's the only work air, aircraft worth flying, really. Okay, let's get Because I flew into, the Huey too, yeah. so. Let's get into early 1975. Yeah. yeah. And what happened then that got you guys steaming south towards the, uh, the South China Sea? Being in maintenance kept me in the dark. And being a second lieutenant and first lieutenant, wasn't in the, you didn't have a whole lot of need to know sometimes, other than you had to get aircraft prepared to fly mission profile-wise. And so it was in that time frame where we were talking about and not a Saigon evacuation, but to go support, I can't remember what we were talking about. I don't remember it being talking about evacuation. I remember we had to get aircraft ready. We have, our squadron was 18 aircraft, and now our, our squadron was getting ready to go composite. And I say composite, composite meant we have 18 46s. We were going to get four 53s, two Hueys, and four gun, uh, Cobra gunships. That's a composite squadron. And we were getting ready to go composite because they had planned to go aboard ship for six month cruise. So that was a precursor that we were going under. And all of a sudden, this was a, uh, we were getting aircraft ready to fly and to go aboard ship. And I remember we, we, were, we were flying, gonna go off the coast of Vietnam. And that's really all I knew at the time. And so we were putting aircraft on ships that came by, ships of opportunity. And so the USS Blue Ridge, a communication ship, came by, and we put two on that one. They serve great meals there. They have lobsters all the time. I and think all we've got stuff. some pictures here for it, too. There's the Blue Ridge Blue on Ridge, the bottom. Yeah. yeah, the Blue Ridge. And so we put two helicopters on that one. Those guys had it pretty good. They got to eat in flight suits and all that good stuff and good food. The USS Dubuque, we had 646s on that one. We put one in the...